watching Downers Grove Television, Channel 6. Welcome to today's tidings. I'm your host, Joyce Tumia. With me today are a couple of beekeepers, Chuck and Karen Lawrence, and we are going to learn about beekeeping. They have been doing this for 41 years. Now, I really want to know how you got involved in this. I earlier heard just the very beginning of this, but you've been doing it for 41 years and Take it away. How did, how did you become interested in this? Picture us 41 years ago. We were Racine natives, met in college at the University of Wisconsin Stout, mm -hmm. and came down to Northbrook, Illinois, where we both had our first teaching jobs. We were hippies and ah. Vietnam pacifists and so mm -hmm. on, wanting to live very, very naturally and eschew the uh, materialism of our parents. And so Charles was in a dentist's office one afternoon reading Mother Earth News mm -hmm. and saw a magazine about beekeeping or an article about beekeeping. He remembered that when his father had bees at the home hobby farm in Wisconsin that uh, he was really interested in at the time, but his father mm -hmm. was merely a bee haver. A not a haver. beekeeper. He did not enjoy the bees, did not work them, manage them well. Hmm. And thus, when the bees died one winter, mm -hmm. he just put them in an old chicken coop and never replenished them with live bees. Ah. And so when Chuck called his father that evening and said, do you still have the hives up there in the chicken coop? And his mm -hmm. dad said, yes. He said, I'd like to begin them again. I'd like to get the help of, of your cousin, and mm -hmm. perhaps I can start two hives up there on the property in Wisconsin, which is about, what, an hour north of Northbrook, Charles? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, so that's how we did it. Right. Yes. Okay. And he was a very good salesperson. Mm -hmm. At Glenbrook South High School, he sold the honey. And pretty soon the next year, he convinced mm. me, I need four hives. Ah. The next year, eight hives. And so on and so on and on. So you obviously ended up getting caught up in this too, and probably um, I did. Okay. And uh, at one time, then we had 150 hives and three children and teaching. But beekeeping was a wonderful, wonderful hobby. Why don't you tell them a little bit about about the hobby of beekeeping and, and how it's well, going? Yeah. What in the article decided? What in the article made you become interested in this? Other well, than the just, fact that you knew there were some hives available. It was like a flashback. I, I thought about, about these hives that when I was a kid, and, and mm -hmm. they were much in, much interest to me. I was more or less scared of the bees at that time, but it sounded like an interesting, fascinating type of thing. The way the article is worded, and mm -hmm. uh, I thought we'd give it a try. And so mm -hmm. uh, we got very. I got very infatuated with it. We ordered our bees that first year through the help of my dad's cousin, who had ten uh, existing beehives uh, up in Wisconsin, and we were able to get our beehives started. We buy bees in crates called packages. They're screened okay. in boxes, and uh, they come early in the spring, and we put them in a in a beehive, a standard beehive, and the uh, bees take that and accept that as their home, and they they make their uh, hive. They draw the wax and they uh, produce the honey in that hive. That's their basic uh, the domicile where they live in. Then. Okay, let's back up a little already here. Um, the hives that you were talking about that were on the hobby farm were man-made hives, or uh, they were yes. commercially made by a beehive company. Okay. And although you could make those hives uh, by yourself if you had equipment in a workshop and equipment to do that, but most people buy their equipment from a bee supply house okay. and then assemble it. It has to be nailed together and then painted, and of course that's what they they build for their hives to the bees to live in. And they do that, I mean, there isn't a way to just find a hive in nature and attract the bees. And, and could I address that one? And yeah. the interesting thing is, in the 41 years that have transpired since mm -hmm. we first started, things have changed a great deal. I 41 bet. years ago, the, the bees were more aggressive than they are today. Okay. They have tried to breed our bees for gentleness today. Hmm. There were very few books about bees. There mm -hmm. are hundreds or perhaps even thousands of books today. We had no internet. We had no computers, no, no internet. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so, you know, uh, the videos were few and far between. So mm -hmm. uh, the ability to learn about beekeeping is much better today than it was when I started back in 1971. And, uh, but with the help of other people, uh, mm -hmm. beekeepers clubs, we, we joined a local beekeeping organization here in the Chicago suburban area known as Cook to Page Beekeepers. Really? And uh, many uh, people that come for the, you know, to these meetings are, have lots of good sage advice about how to do things with bees. Mm -hmm. And it's just it's a very nice group of people that are willing to help out each other. Uh, kind of like a social club, but mm -hmm. all with a, with a common topic in, in their mind. So mm -hmm. uh, it's been very valuable for us. We've been active in that group. I've served as president and also served as uh, state beekeeping president for our State Beekeepers Association. Wow. And then I also teach classes today in, in beginning beekeeping in the Chicago suburban area in Wheaton and in Geneva. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, it's, it's really been a, a, a great uh, pastime, a great hobby. And it's a very learning type of uh, activity that uh, the beehive itself is extremely interesting to follow all the activities of what goes on mm -hmm. amongst the worker bees, the queen bee, and the drone bees. Is that one of the reasons that you use man-made beehives instead of, I mean, I'm sorry, oh. these are really basic questions, you know. I guess I would picture bees out in the wild having their hives and that you find a hive and you kidnap it or something or you capture it and you transplant it. And that it. is a wonderful question. But you can't see inside those no. is one reason you have the man-made ones so that you can monitor them better and take care of them better. And, and you know, back again, let's say 200, 300 years ago, when bees were in log gums or straw skeps, okay. they could not be easily managed. Okay. And so it was, in fact, I have a picture here of what a typical uh, beehive looks like. And the beauty about this type of a hive here is that you can remove the cover, remove the frames, which are individual slots in there, and take those foundations out, check the quality of the the laying of the queen, mm -hmm. check the workers, check the honey, the pollen, okay. everything that you need to check in there. Wow. And that enables us now to be a much better beekeeper. Okay. You it can allows, what's going uh, on. allows manipulation of the hive. And, uh -huh. you know, honeybees by nature don't live in hives, they live in hollow trees. That's their preferred domicile. And didn't know that. Yes. That's and we've just basically taken them out of trees and put them into hives so we can manage the bees. Now, every so often, colonies do swarm, and they form a, a, a large gathering of bees or mm -hmm. ball of bees in a shrub or a bush. Mm -hmm. and, and beekeepers are very willing to go over and, and entice them to come into a, live in the hive. Mm -hmm. And so we get lots of calls for swarms oh. from, uh, you know, the d local animal protection unit, police departments, fire mm -hmm. departments, because there are swarms that exist in towns, and people okay. are paranoid and scared of bees. So yeah. beekeepers are on a swarm list, a swarm call list to, to collect these for, and get them off of people's properties. But uh, wow. basically, you know, the bees today are gentle mm -hmm. compared to how they were years ago. They, the bee, people that breed bees today have bred from the gentleness mm -hmm. end of the line and, and produce gentle queens, which in, in that case produce gentle worker bees in the hive. So, okay. uh, so if one could set up with bees from a log that were found, mm -hmm. it probably still wouldn't be a good idea because they wouldn't have been bred for the gentleness. Probably right. If they're from, okay. if they're from a wild strain, it would yeah. probably have some more aggressive behavior habits. Okay. Yeah. And if you still get stung by a bee that has been bred for gentleness, because I suppose uh -huh. it could still and happen, do. Yes. you know, if it, something happens, um, does that make any difference in the level of the allergic reaction for those for whom a bee sting is no very difference serious. between a, a gentle strain of bees. Okay. All bees have stingers. Mm -hmm. They all okay. react to the same, whether they're a wild honeybee okay. coming out of a wild environment or if they're coming from a, a domestic domicile. Okay. They are their stingers are still have the same portions of venom in them, and and people have to learn uh, how to treat that. You know, okay. a lot of people today carry these epipens, which is a, mm -hmm. a uh, chemical that they can give themselves a shot after they've been stung by bees so they don't have an allergic reaction. Okay. I think okay. it's also important to point out, however, that many people think that they are allergic to honeybees when really, when they have been stung by a yellow jacket, ah. a wasp, a hornet. Ah. Those insects do not leave a stinger in your skin. Mm -hmm. They can sting you multiple times. Mm -hmm. A honeybee will only sting you once and okay. leaves its stinger in your skin. Okay. The thing that you mm -hmm. don't want to do is squeeze that stinger out because okay. by squeezing it out, you are actually squeezing the venom in. Ah. You want to take a credit card or a a sharp 
a hive tool. Blade of some kind. Mm -hmm. yeah. And scrape it off. Hmm. And then watch your symptoms. Mm -hmm. Typical symptoms might include redness, itching, mm -hmm. perhaps a little bit of swelling. Mm -hmm. Atypical symptoms would be a difficulty breathing. And that's mm -hmm. when you want to seek medical help. Immediately. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is very interesting. <laughs> I'm um, glad to hear that. And in fact, the picture that you showed, I mean, it almost looks more like a file cabinet or something. Yes. You know, it looks yes. very businesslike. Yes. Yeah, well, the, the, the hive itself is just a, a series of stack boxes on top of each other. Each of those stack boxes has units in it. It's like a file cabinet. Mm -hmm. If you had a four drawer file cabinet, mm -hmm. each of those drawers would have certain records and files in there. Well, each of our boxes, as they are stacked up, have frames in which the bees can either store honey in or raise their family on, or make it what we call brood, a brood area. Okay. And so those colonies that you see in that picture are some skyscraper hives. Those are some really good they colonies. Are, they made a lot of extra honey last year. They're about as tall as you are. They produced about 200 pounds of surplus honey that we harvested. Pounds. Yeah, And we still left about 100 pounds on those hives so they had food for the winter. Because bees do not hibernate. They live off the honey they've stored. And bees make honey so they can survive the winter. They don't know when to quit making it. As long as they mm -hmm. have a good source of flowers and, mm -hmm. and water and, and the fields that they need to work, they can make, continue to make honey, uh, and they make much more than they need. So the beekeeper reaps the rewards and takes the extra. Okay. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I would imagine it would occur to people to wonder why bees make honey or, you know, that they must make it for some reason, like food for themselves, and therefore if somebody else is going and taking it all, but I didn't know that it wasn't all, mm -hmm. you know, that <coughs> there wouldn't be bees anymore because that's they right. wouldn't have their food. Mm -hmm. So exactly. that's a, that, I'm very glad you brought that up. Yeah. So you have to learn how much to leave. Yeah, about 80 to 100 pounds. It's their fuel. It's their, they're able to keep warm by forming a cluster in amongst the honeycombs in the winter, and they, uh, as they consume honey, a revolving mass about the size of a basketball. Mm -hmm. They uh, they vibrate their wings and they produce a little bit of body heat and they share that heat with each other in this cluster. Those that are on the outer side of the cluster, when they get chilled, they move in, the warm ones move out. So it's a constant re revolving mass all winter long, bees containing, uh, eating the honey. And in the center of that cluster mm -hmm. is their queen bee. Mm -hmm. They keep her uh, temperature at about 85 degrees year round. It can be 10 below outside that hive in the winter and inside that cluster where she is, it's 85 degrees. And the same thing in the summer. When it's 110 outside, she's, they maintain coolness. They bring water into the front door of the hive and they evaporate it by fanning their wings over mm -hmm. the water droplets and they're able to cool that hive and keep her at that constant temperature. It's an amazing fact of nature what they're able wow. to do to condition that their hive. Is very impressive. I know Isn't when that we impressive? were I know. Yeah, yes. when we were chatting mm -hmm. earlier, you mentioned mm -hmm. that a bee community is a perfect community. Absolutely perfect community. It's a perfect community yes. because of even, uh, even down to the end when the bee gives itself herself mm -hmm. for the hive mm -hmm. by stinging you, she dies. And even, you know, they go from cleaning the cell to taking care of the babies, taking care of the queen, feeding the drone, housekeeping, mm -hmm. guarding the entrance, fanning and so on, all these steps wow. during the time that they are working in the hive. They then go out of the hive and start collecting nectar. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of it is at the end of about six weeks, in the summertime, they have worn out their wings, come back to the hive, they have a huge store of honey, but their wings are ragged and they can't make it. And they usually just end up dying in the grass, again, giving themselves for the community of the hive, which says to the two of us, you know, mm -hmm. this is how we should all be living. You know mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Everybody's got a job to do, and they mm -hmm. do it three weeks in the hive, taking care of the hive and the brood, and then three weeks outside the hive, gathering nectar, pollen, mm -hmm. water to, for survival and for the food that that hive needs to flourish. Now in the winter time, however, they do live longer than six weeks because okay. again, remember, they do not wear out their wings. Mm. If she, if the queen lays the eggs, let's say in the end of September or October and they hatch out, those bees will stay in the hive until probably February, the queen is going to start laying eggs again. Okay. Maybe they will take a couple cleansing flights in a good January thaw, February mm -hmm. thaw. A typical March or April, they'll get out and visit some, oh, um, maples, willows with the pollen, mm -hmm. dandelions, and so on, uh, going into some of the tulips and crocus and so on. Okay. But um, by that time then, they might start wearing out their wings, but realize that these bees then may have been several months old. And so they do live longer because they do not wear out their wings in the wintertime. Wow. Okay, this is really amazing. So 
and you mentioned trees, because I would think that would be another question people would have. Do they only get the pollen from flowers? Do they, you know, do you need gardens or do you need to plant a lot of flowers or something or make sure that your beehives are near flowers? Well, you need, you, you need a, a variety of plants. For, okay. for example, many of our trees uh, in Northern Illinois bloom. Mm -hmm. uh, example, black locust trees bloom like the last week of May. Uh, we have linden or basswood trees which have flowers. And, and then of course, all the fruit trees that bloom, those, are all, those have flowers all attractive to bees. And so those are trees that give off nectar. But then there's, of course, there's wildflowers, there's mm -hmm. weeds and so forth that bees can gather nectar from. There's uh, all kinds of plants you can plant actually in your backyard garden if you want to encourage attract honeybees bees. attract to come to your yard. And of course, bees also have to have a water source. They have to get, be able to collect water. And uh, so all these things are important when you establish bees. You just can't put them out in the middle of a cornfield or a soybean field. Okay. You, you've got to have mm -hmm. uh, areas where, you know, location, location, location is so mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. uh, finding those areas where you have all those things available for the bees. Mm -hmm. We actually keep our bees on uh, Kane County Forest Preserve land just west of Aurora. Mm -hmm. And it's just ideal land because we have a water supply. We've got uh, nectar producing flowers on trees. We have lots of wildflowers and prairie flowers. And so our bees make very good uh, honey from these plants. And plus we have very little insecticides being used ah. in the forest reserves, mm. which are very important. Yeah. And today, you know, the whole problem today with, uh, with the bee survival of bees is that we have so many systemic insecticides out there that are being used on lawns, by golf courses. Uh, we try to tell people if you're going to raise bees, keep away from golf courses, mm -hmm. uh, sewage treatment plants, any place where there's a lot of... Uh, herbicides or insecticides being used. Mm. And because bees are affected by those mm -hmm. chemicals. And so if you're gonna be raising bees, you wanna make sure that they have a healthy environment mm -hmm. to be raised in, so. And with mm. that in mind, we mm -hmm. sometimes think that it perhaps it's more prudent to put your bees in town than it is in the country, especially here in Illinois, where our country consists of corn and soybeans. Mm -hmm. um, here in town, if your community allows it, and there mm -hmm. are many communities that do allow it in the state of Illinois, especially here in the suburban area, those bees are able to visit all of your neighbors' wonderful flowers, their gardens, their strawberries and apple trees, raspberries, mm -hmm. their sedum, and their mint plants and all their herbs, and it's really a wonderful forage. And you know, the past mayor, uh, daily from Chicago mm -hmm. has had beehives on the top of City Hall. Really? And I, he gets ideal forage and ideal nectar from those hives because the bees are able to go out and visit all of the, the community flowers. What about the fact that some of the people might be using insecticides and chemicals and things on their gardens? I think in the, in the directly in the city there's very few insecticides used. There are some probably used in suburban areas but uh, on City Hall, you know, they have a totally green green concept. The whole top of the building is nothing but gardens of flowers, grass, and of course they have, I think there's four beehives up there on top of City Hall. And they have a beekeeper that manages those for him. And I know mm -hmm. Mayor Daly, when he was mayor, he, he always relished the thought that when dignitaries came to town from outside of the city, mm -hmm. he always gave them small jars of honey that was actually produced on top of the city, uh, you know, we got all the gardens down in, in, uh, in the Grand Park, Grand Park yeah. and you've got <laughs> waste areas along Park. the Chicago River, mm -hmm. along the rail, li rail lines coming into Chicago. All those areas produce plants of which bees can make honey from. Mm -hmm. So it was an excellent idea. And in, in, in suburban area, there, yeah, there's insecticides used, mm -hmm. but uh, they're, they're not used in, in the, in the uh, large amount like they would be used out on farms. Okay. And you know, Joyce, you also were talking about your concern as just a person mm -hmm. that you don't want to use these uh, herbicides on right, your lawn right and there are thousands and thousands of suburban people like you that are mm -hmm. saying to their spouses mm -hmm. let's dig our dandelions instead yeah. of spray them right you know let's not worry about putting things down because we don't want our dog to have to walk in the grass mm -hmm. and just as there are people trying to eat organic, mm -hmm. trying to eat local, there are also people that are very very interested in a green environment mm -hmm. that would be like you and they would join in you if you happen to have bees on your property and especially mm -hmm. if you would turn around and give them a couple pounds of honey, uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. uh, so that they could enjoy 
the bounty. Mm -hmm. And so people are really interested in saving our bees. And, mm -hmm. you know, Good. I know that later on you might want to talk to a colony collapse disorder and that problem. Go ahead and discuss it now. Charles, it certainly comes up when we're talking about well, the health of the bees and the colonies and the genetically modified mm -hmm. stuff. <clears throat> Starting in 2006, in the fall of 2006, a beekeeper in Pennsylvania discovered that there was a disorder amongst his bees. He had just mm -hmm. moved a truckload of bees from Pennsylvania to to Florida for pollination and uh, came back in three weeks. The colonies were very strong and healthy when he moved them back down there and he came back in three weeks to check on them and almost all the hives had collapsed. And uh, there was very few bees left in the hive. The idea had just disappeared. Mm -hmm. uh, small cluster of bees with the queen bee, but uh, not a large enough social structure to be able to survive the, the year or do any pollination for mm -hmm. them in the orange groves. So uh, he was the first to report, report about the uh, malady with his bees. And then it started popping up around the country where other beekeepers started noticing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, it got to be known as colony collapse disorder. And uh, researchers from many of the land-grant universities begin, began doing research uh, to f exactly find out and narrow it down as to what it might be that, mm -hmm. that's happening with the bees. And uh, to the point that we had lost a third of the nation's honeybees in this process of a couple of years from uh, 2006 to 2009. Has it been halted, even if we it, don't know what caused it to begin It with? hasn't been totally halted, but... Uh, it seems that the, we've narrowed it down to the mm -hmm. people that suffer from this the most are the commercial beekeepers. These are beekeepers that make their living off of their bees. They mm -hmm. move them on semi-trucks across the nation to pollinate different crops. Mm -hmm. Like uh, almonds in California are one of the large crops that are pollinated by honeybees. There's about two million hives that are brought into California every year to pollinate that almond crop. Then those bees are loaded back on semis and they're low, brought up to Washington, Oregon to pollinate apple orchards and berry crops. And then they may go from there across the country to uh, Georgia for peaches and oranges and then up along the East Coast into blueberries in Maine. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, they're being paid a fee for having bees in the pollinated crops. Well, mm -hmm. this puts tremendous stress on a bee colony. It'd be like you, if you had a job and you, every three or four months they were moving you to a new city. Mm. And when you when you get stressed out, you get sick. And that's mm -hmm. what's happening. That's one of the things that's happening to okay. bees, the stress issue. Okay. And then of course, uh, today also we have a new line of insecticides called systemics, mm -hmm. where it's, uh, the seed is coated yeah. with an insecticide and it comes up through the plant as it grows and it's systemic action, it goes in through the stalk, out into the leaves and branches and into the flowers and pollen. Mm -hmm. And uh, this alone, this, this new type of uh, uh, systemic chemicals in these GMO crops are also a, another product that's killing our bees. Mm -hmm. And uh, these chemicals are safer for humans because we aren't using field sprays and spray application, but at the same time, they're very, very deadly for honeybees. Mm -hmm. And w bees going out every day and visiting these flowers that have this chemical insecticide in the plant, in the flower, one or two plants or flowers a day isn't going to hurt the bees, but you've got mm -hmm. thousands of bees going out mm -hmm. and doing this. It'd be like you taking an aspirin for a headache, it's going to mm -hmm. cure your headache. You take a whole bottle, it'll kill you. So mm -hmm. uh, that's how it builds up in the colonies. Mm -hmm. So it's, okay. that's another issue that has to do with colony collapse disorder, poor, nu poor nutrition, monoculture of crops, mm -hmm. where we, don't, we, we <laughs> kill all the weeds, we raise certain crops, and we raise them over and over and over again on that same type of land. And that uh, also and, and no fence rows, no weeds for the bees to yeah. visit. Bees used to have mm -hmm. the wild fence rows to get flowers and find nectar sources in, and those don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. Farmers have plowed those all up so they can have more land to farm their crops. Well, Is let's it? spend more time talking about why the bees are important. I mean, not just because we like honey, but we, not only do we like honey, but it has nutritional value. It can be used on wounds. Indeed, um, yes. And the fact that we talked a little bit about the bees and their importance in pollination, but I don't know, did we cover that enough? We can. Oh, never enough. Okay, never enough. <laughs> then let's really um, drive that point home okay. and talk about the other nice like byproducts yes, here. Yes, I'd like to show some of the products, but when you're talking about pollination, actually one of the most important things that bees do mm -hmm. is not collecting honey, but the pollination. Okay. Because one third of every single one of the bites that we eat is due to the pollination of honeybees. They go to a flower and on their hairy little bodies, they collect the pollen dust. Mm -hmm. They mix it with a little bit of nectar. Mm -hmm. They have little pellets of it, which they bring back to the hive. We collect it for just a few weeks in the early summer and dry it. And the pollen then is used to feed their baby bees. Now human beings also do eat pollen, mm -hmm. but as virtue of the pollination process, then we have strawberries and apples and so on. 
But even more interesting, when I say one out of every three bites of food, we can also attribute that to our milk and our beef, because milk cows and beef animals eat alfalfa, which the seed had to be pollinated by the honeybee. Hmm. So pollination is a very, very important part. And one mm -hmm. third of the food that we eat is pollinated by honeybees. So if you think about that in the big picture, you know, yeah. every third spoon of food you put in your mouth, something is credible to the honeybee. You got all your fruits, your vegetables, your, your, uh, your nuts, nuts, nut crops, uh, your seed crops that have to be pollinated, uh, you know, for producing milk for milk cows mm -hmm. and beef for beef cattle, they have to have forage crops. And mm -hmm. those crops are dependent upon bees for pollination and for producing seed. So you've got this big spectrum of things that bees uh, do pollinate. They say they, a dollar in cent figure put on pollination, bees pollinate a, uh, about $14 billion worth of pollination. If you would put that to dollar and cents, that's what their uh -huh. value of their service is, the, the crops and the foods that we eat. Mm -hmm. So it's very important. Yeah. Uh, and we're, we actually, we've covered a lot in the amount of time that we've been talking so far, but we don't have a whole lot of time left. We really could do a part two or probably even a part three on this. <laughs> so let's at least quickly talk about the honey. And um, speaking of money and honey, you just won an award. Let's oh, yes, mention Charles. that. And then I think people might even know that honey can come in different flavors. I'll let you explain that, dear. So well, uh, in January, we went to mm -hmm. the American Beekeeping Federation Convention in Las Vegas. Charles happens to be a very competitive person anyway, and he always brings honey along for a show. Mm -hmm. But this year he not only won, I think it was four or five blue ribbons, but he also won best in show with his uh, chunk pack of honey wow. in a one-pound container. Four one-pound containers brought mm -hmm. in $500. It was $125 a pound auction, yeah. at the honey auction. That is yes. really something. That so he really was extremely something. pleased about that. Okay. And Another thing I might good. also think is very important to point out mm -hmm. is that there are different colors of honey. Mm -hmm. Would you hold that, Charles? What kind of honey is that? This is our early season honey. This is black locust and linden honey. Very okay. mild, very delicate flavored. Uh, harvested early in the season in July. And then as the season goes on, the honey becomes more amber. This is mostly clover and alfalfa. Mm -hmm. This is probably what most people would see in the grocery store. Mm -hmm. And then another type of honey is a, a real dark honey. This is from buckwheat, buckwheat plants, buckwheat flowers. Uh, very strong, tastes very similar to molasses. So mm -hmm. we have a wide variety of colors and, and tastes of honey, yeah. depending on what the flowers that the bees visit. Okay. Some and of the important books today that you might want to okay. think about uh, that are important to beekeepers and that, and to humans. As, uh, we have two, we've brought a couple today. One is called the Fruitless Fall, and this uh, goes into detail about uh, uh, what bees are being threatened with today. Why we have colony collapse disorder and how important bees are to our life, mm -hmm. our life and our lifestyle and our okay. food uh, crops. There's another one that Karen will talk to you about. And a spring without bees is also one that talks to the idea that we may be losing our bees and what would happen. It's almost the Rachel Carson mm -hmm. of 2012. Okay. This honeybee democracy is another good one, Hold a new one, that um, it basically it talks about the hive and how it functions. And again, the function of the hive is an almost perfect society. It is a perfect society. It's a har harmonious uh, okay. uh, working status of all the occupants of that hive to take care of the hive. Okay. And, and it's extremely interesting to, to read. We will put your information in the credits of the program so people know how to contact you if they want to hear Thank a talk. You. That would be we know wonderful. that you have Thank products you. maybe at farmer's markets. Yes. People can try right. honey and products like um, beeswax and so on there. And I hope they read the books. And I'm sorry we didn't get to cover more. I think we've covered a lot of basics, but it's a good start for people. Absolutely. Thank you so yes. much for coming and sharing this very valuable information. Thank you for having us. And it's something we really enjoy doing. Thank, thank you, you for having us, yes. Thank you. This yes. is a very worthwhile topic. Oh, thank you. Thank you for watching. Please join me again for future episodes of Today's Tidings.